did match. Make the Thank match. you so All much right. to everybody Thank who you. calls. You can still keep calling. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1 p.m. Stay tuned next for your own health and fitness. Welcome to your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman. Jeff Fawcett and I come to you weekly with a critical independent voice on the politics and practice of health and the environment. Are we suffering from too much civilization? For example, I'm sure you're aware of the claim that we are on the verge of or even in the midst of a mass extinction of plants and animals brought on by human activity. For decades, scientists and environmental organizations have been talking about both species extinction and loss of biodiversity as serious threats. Lots of national and international effort by both government and civil society has been focused on stopping the onslaught with the very best civilization has to offer. Science, technology, experts, and governments, including the use of police power to enforce conservation policies. Yet, the process now seems unstoppable. Some scientists and activists argue that conservation of species, which means conservation of the ecosystem on which they depend, is accomplished best by the people indigenous to the ecosystem. People who do not manage endangered species, but live among and depend on them. Deep Green Resistance is an organization that takes the position that civilization and its benefits are not only of no help in solving the problems of species extinction, climate crisis, and ecosystem collapse, but is the active cause of those threats. Today, you'll hear about their strategy for saving life on Earth. My guests are Will Falk and Max Wilbert, both members of the Deep Green Resistance Steering Committee. Will is an award-winning writer, lawyer, and activist. His work has been published by Earth Island Journal, The Dark Mountain Project, Counterpunch, and the San Diego Free Press, among others. Max Wilbert cut his teeth organizing against racism, police brutality, and war in Seattle. He now lives in rural Oregon and focuses on providing training and skills to activists, as well as forest and water protection campaigns in the Great Basin. He's currently working on his first book, which looks at the costs and problems of green technology. Will and Max, welcome to your own health and fitness. It's good to be be here. here. (laughs) Thanks. Deep Green Resistance argues that civilization itself is the problem. A lot of what your analysis consists of is focuses on that idea. My understanding of what you mean by civilization has to do with at the level of organization that human beings are currently at. They are beyond the carrying capacity of ecosystems where they live. So, could you uh, comment on that and what exactly it is that you mean by civilization and why it's problematic? Yeah, um, we're really careful about how we define civilization. Uh, When you look at the word civilization, you'll realize that the root of the word is civil. And civil derives from civis, which comes from the Latin civitatis, which means city-state. So from there, we can define civilization as a culture that is a complex of stories, institutions, and artifacts that both leads to and emerges from the growth of cities. And we define cities so as to distinguish them from camps, villages, and and the like as people living more or less permanently in one place in densities high enough to require the routine importation of food and other necessities of life. Uh, this, This becomes problematic because when people live in populations that exceed the carrying capacity of their land base, they end up stripping their land of the necessities of life and they have to look to other lands to get what they need. Um, and it's it's no coincidence that many scholars date the beginning of civilization uh, with the birth of agriculture and that's usually between 10 and, and 12,000 years ago. And 
despite uh, the fact that agriculture has favorable connotations in most circles, even in in most uh, environmental circles, I think, um, the great author Lear Keith has described uh, what what is exactly the problem with agriculture. And she says, in very brute terms, you take a piece of land, you clear every living thing off of it, and then you plant it to human use. And instead of sharing that land with the other million creatures who need to live there, you're only growing humans on it. And Lier calls that biotic cleansing. Um, so with its roots in agriculture and with its roots in biotic cleansing and with its roots in, in humans exceeding carrying capacity, civilization has quite simply been destroying the planet from its very beginning. So um, let me ask a question about agriculture and what that encompasses. For instance, in contrast to agriculturally based uh, uh, civilization groups, uh, one thinks of hunter-gatherers uh, as peoples who basically live by harvesting uh as opposed to producing food off of land and that they live within that land's limits. But there have been uh, a number of, uh, of active groups and scientists looking at something ca called agroecology, which is an attempt to produce food intentionally on plots of land, but to do so within... Uh, the limits of the ecology where that happens. Uh, so does agriculture include practices like, uh, well, permaculture and uh, agroecology? I think, I think one of the keys there is, is what you said about, about permaculture. And uh, I don't know if I would, I would define agriculture along the same lines as, as permaculture. So you 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 mentioned hunter gatherers, and I think that um, hunter gatherers have have truly been and have truly created the only sustainable cultures that that the planet has has seen. And um, usually, when you say something like that, people uh, get kind of um, upset, or they they think, "What can you mean? Like we could all go back and live as as hunter gatherers?" Um, but but the truth is, humans have been around between. 300 and 400,000 years we haven't evolved all that much from from what we were 300,000 and 400,000 years ago and from 400,000 years ago until about 10,000 years ago all humans lived as hunter gatherers and whatever whatever their problems might have been uh the wholesale destruction of the planet was not one of their problems <laughs> and um it just simply wasn't uh thinkable that we could push this planet and that we could we could take down all the rest of life on earth with us um so we have a long tradition of living as hunter gatherers and in fact agriculture is kind of this new fad uh with humanity and um we 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 can live that way and in fact there are about 46 uh hunter gatherer cultures that still exist around the world um and and if we're ever going to get back to truly sustainable cultures, I think they'll have to resemble the hunter-gatherer uh, lifestyles that, that truly are our heritage. The implication of what, uh, what you're describing is that the solutions to the serious problems we face from the standpoint of deep green resistance seem to be that we need to live within the carrying capacity of the ecosystems within which we where we are one of the questions i have about that is how difficult it is to define an appropriate population size and ecosystem boundary um, there are lots of ways to define an ecosystem it could be in terms of watershed or it could be in terms of um, uh, keystone species, uh, a lot of ways to do it. So in terms of population size and uh, just the idea of carrying capacity, how do we figure out what those boundaries are? Well, I think that uh, I think that underlying, underlying your question, or, or this can lead to a really good point, and I, I think that the way we define that is going to be very different for every 
uh, land base, every natural community uh, that humans are seeking to live in. And I think that, um, you know, you, you would live differently uh, and with different uh, d- a definition for human carrying capacity in in uh, central or northern California, uh, where you are, uh, compared to the high desert of, of Utah, where I am. Um, so I think that it would necessarily be different for every one of those uh, natural communities. And I think that um, there was an organization of human culture that existed on this continent um, until about two or 300 years ago where uh, traditional and indigenous peoples had had more or less figured out uh, what the definition of human carrying capacity was uh, for their ecosystems. And um, I think that one of the, you know, one of the really uh, brilliant um, indigenous writers, Vine Deloria, um, in the in the late 20th century, he he talked a lot about how um, the only really sustainable government that we can implement implement around the world are are these local autonomous um, cultures that that resemble much uh, resemble much like uh, the traditional cultures that existed um, on North America before before the arrival of Europeans. Uh, so. I guess that was a long way to answer your question as um, I think that's going to depend on on the each individual local land base and um, it's going to rely on the people living there um, to really figure that out. As a consequence of that, this analysis that uh, Deep Green Resistance has, you have a, a two-part analysis. One is that uh, in industrial civilization is in, is collapsing. We are not only seeing biotic collapse, but we're also witnessing social collapse. And it is that social system that is the cause of the biotic collapses. Uh, the second part of the analysis, which in many ways distinguishes your work from other organizations, even, even organizations that are as militant as yours is, is that what will survive is self-sustaining modes of living. I would like you to talk about first the what the analysis is of the pending collapse of industrial civilization and then what it means to be survived by self-sustaining modes of living or communities, settlements, the analysis. I think you know what, this what and, you and before me? before you go this this is uh, Max Wilbert who's speaking. Yeah, yeah, I'm so happy to be on. Thanks for for having us and for these great questions. Um, so I think yeah, the collapse is ongoing, and and I think you know you mentioned biotic collapse, and I really think that's the key point. Um, you know, we we are seeing this this sort of collapse or degradation of industrial society, but um, you know, unfortunately, this society doesn't seem like it's on the brink. Um, and I say, unfortunately, because it's this culture that's causing the destruction of the planet. And, you know, just last week, I heard that the U.S. overtook Saudi Arabia as the world's largest oil producer. And, you know, unfortunately, this culture is doing whatever it can to sustain itself, including, you know, drilling for oil in the Arctic and going to the deep water and tar sands and and all these sorts of schemes that that any empire tries to come up with to sustain its you know, it's it's despotic rule as as these natural limits come to the fore. So, but you know, whether you look at whatever sort of indicators you look at in terms of the natural world, we're seeing uh, mass destruction. I mean, scientists are estimating now that seventy percent of coral reefs are going to be gone in the next few decades. There are one hundred and fifty dead zones in the ocean. Uh, corporations dump something like 5 million gallons per day of toxins across the planet. Um, you know, the, 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 the populations of all kinds of species are collapsing down to the phytoplankton in the oceans who are responsible for the majority of the oxygen that we breathe on this planet. And their, their populations have fallen by 40% or more. Um, so... You know, we could we could go on and on about the different things: deforestation, the loss of old growth forests, uh, the loss of of soils and desertification due to industrial agriculture. 
um, the toxification of the environment through those various chemicals that are being released. So I think it's pretty obvious what this culture is doing to the planet. And, um, you know, it's not a new, it's not a new thing. People have this tendency to look at what's happening today and, uh, and think that it's a result of, of modern capitalism or modern industrialism. But I sort of look at those factors as just gasoline poured on the fire. They're, they're accelerants. They're not really the, the, the root cause of the problem in some ways. Um, I was just reading a, a study the other day that was looking at a, an archaeological site in Israel, one of the longest continuously inhabited places on the planet, this, this small port city uh, that's been inhabited for six or 7,000 years. I'm, I don't think I'm getting that number correct, but, but a long time. And uh, what they found was that, you know, as soon as the city was created and as soon as it turned from a village um, and into a city, and that, that gets back to that definition that Will mentioned at the beginning in terms of importation of routine importation of resources, as soon as they got to that point where they weren't really living off the land and in relationship with the land, but they were sort of living in this commodity economy where things were delivered to them from elsewhere, it's sort of an out of sight, out of mind thing. And, you know, it seems pretty clear from not only what's happening on the planet, but also social science research and so on, that humans are are best suited to live in these small localized communities. You know, people talk about how we're made to live with a, a community of up to 100 or 150 people maximum. And when, when our societies start to get bigger than that, in terms of people we interact with or are around on a day-to-day -day basis, we just kind of start to fall apart. So I think that that really reflects the inherent localism that that defines us as a species. And, uh, you know, we're, we've strayed from that over the past several thousand years. And and as a result, we're living through the sixth great mass extinction event. I want to pa I, I want to I I pause here and uh, to I'm sorry for interrupting, but I need to uh, no ID ID the show. This is your own health and fitness. I'm Jeffrey Fawcett. I'm talking today with I've just been talking with uh, Max Wilbert, and I'm also talking to Will Falk earlier about deep brain resistance. Th this is a very telling idea of when things fall apart because we are living in communities that are really larger than we can handle. And in, in a way, that points to the collapse of civilization in addition to the bad effects that it has. But I want to hear you talk about, because this is, like I said, one of the unique things about uh, that I've found about deep green resistance is this, this second part of the analysis, not just that human beings, human societies are causing devastating environmental effects that part of the, the, the strategy is to seek to find self-sustaining modes of living. So I would like to, for you to talk about that part of your analysis. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I can speak to that too. So... You know, Will mentioned that these things kind of have to look different in, in different places. And I think people often, you know, we talk about this in DGR, this idea of self-sustaining communities and, and localism and so on. And But it's not really our, it's not really the core of the work that we do. And the reason for that is because there are a lot of people already doing so much great work in that area. Um, and so because of that, you know, because there are so many people working on those sorts of things in the permaculture movement, in the rewilding movement, you know, in in this sort of broad, uh, broad back to the land movement that we're sort of seeing a, a, a new iteration of um, restoration and so on. Um, we're not really taking a primary role there because we're seeing a big gap in terms of uh, the resistance part. And that's why our group is called Deep Green Resistance is because we're focused on that. So we have this, we have these ideas around uh, restoration and self-sustaining communities, um, you know, and, and at the same time, it's not, it's not really my primary work for myself. I mean, it's something that I do personally, you know, I like to go out and harvest mushrooms and collect acorns from the oak trees where I live and 
and learn, you know, learn how to live in balance with the place where I am and begin to develop that sort of relationship um, and, and build a community of people who are doing the same thing and spread those ideas. Um, but at the same time, um, the wor- I don't think the reason that the world is being killed is a lack of, you know, sustainable eco-villages or communes. Um, I think the real reason the world is being killed is, is more direct. It's looking at, you know, the, the industry, uh, the military activity, you know, the military is the largest polluter on the planet. Um, so I think in terms of, uh, in terms of that type of work, it's absolutely something that we like to highlight because I think those two wings of the movement have to go hand in hand. You know, we need, we need people doing the healing work, the restoration work, the creating sustainable communities and sane communities and, and helping people to recover from, you know, this culture destroys our, our internal selves just as it's destroying the external world all around us, you know, through propaganda and through patriarchy and racism and all these different uh, toxic lessons, the addictions and so on that this culture feeds us. Uh, and I think we, we absolutely need to repair that and, and work on and address those issues critically. And I think that also needs to be paired inextricably with a resistance movement that's, that's working sort of on the front lines to stop the, the harms that are still devastating everything and making things worse. Uh, one of the things that I think also is unique about your organization is that it does not see itself as, uh, at least as I, as I understand what your objectives are and how you how you see the work that you do, is that you are not a an environmental organization. That is, you are not focused singly on ecological issues, but also on social work, so that your organization has serious discussions about how doing this uh, this Save the Planet work as being integral to and inseparable from social justice issues, such as you just mentioned. It's, so, actually, I'd like you to talk uh, talk a little bit more about how those things get integrated. Sure, I can speak to that briefly, and then Will might have something to add. But uh, one of my friends is is this really brilliant feminist, and she said something a couple years ago that just blew me away, uh, just, just the concise way that she phrased it. And she said, all oppression is tied to resource extraction. And uh, I think that's critical. It's basically a materialist analysis, right? I mean, this goes back a long ways in the radical movement. This goes back over a hundred plus years in terms of leftist politics. Uh, and an understanding that, you know, racism doesn't just exist because some white people decided, Hey, let's hate black people. That's a great idea. You know, they, they created racism to justify slavery, to justify exploitation, to justify colonialism. Uh, and, you know, it's the same way with patriarchy. They, you know, the, the culture has created these ideologies, these toxic lessons around pornography and objectification and media and so on in order to justify the, the uh, resource extraction from women. And, you know, that comes in the form of free labor or women working for a lower wage right. or it comes in the form of, you know, women having to basically have children to feed the empire. You know, I mean, there's a reason that uh, right-wing politicians in this country are against, against abortion and against women having control of their own reproductive systems and their own bodies. And it's because they want growth. And the way you get growth is in large part via population growth. They want more babies. They want more people. They want more consumers. They want more soldiers. They want more of everything. And, uh, you know, women don't want to have that. So, you know, when you, if you look at the, the numbers, when you give women control over their, their own bodies and, and autonomy, then they actually choose to have much less children. That's right. And uh, so all of these things are inextricably connected. I think it's a total mistake. You know, I mean, you could talk about immigration, for example, as well for a hot topic right now. You know, the you know, farmers who are living in rural Mexico don't just decide, hey, let's pick up my whole life and move to the United States. You know, 
the reason that most of these people are are moving is because they're fleeing war, they're fleeing environmental destruction, they're fleeing violence, they're fleeing, you know, the corruption of their societies that have been, you know, and that's the legacy of colonization, of globalized trade, free trade agreements, of capitalism, and the sort of imperialist policies that the U.S. and other nations have been pushing for decades and hundreds of years. So I think to even look at these sort of issues as separate things is sort of a mistake. I think they're all part of the same struggle and they're all related. They all have their differences, of course, and it's important to look individually at each struggle and each situation as a discrete case. But at the same time, it's all part of the system of how this culture extracts resources and, and you know, works to control and exploit the entire planet. So, Will, we've got a little bit of time if you'd like to comment. Yeah, I, uh, I love everything Max said, and I, I love that quote about oppression is always linked to resource extraction. Uh, I think the only thing that I would add or, or the only different angle that I, I take with it is, is in the same vein that resource extraction is how the powerful get their power. There's no, there's no coincidence that one of the oldest and most destructive environmental practices, mining, is tied to the construction of, you know, the first bronze swords, the first iron weapons, um, the first steel weapons. Uh, these, this kind of environmental extraction was used and um, proliferated because it created military power. And once people have military power, they can force other people to do uh, what they want for them. Um, it's also no coincidence that the first, um, it, w it wasn't until agriculture that we saw the first standing armies, because once you could feed enough people that there could, that, that you could um, take away from people's uh, need to be hunting and gathering that you could now, you know, put a sword or a spear in their hand and say, hey, let's go take something from someone else. Um, so just like Max said, they're all connected. Um, deep down, they're all connected. And, and I would say that environmental extraction um, is, it goes hand in hand with, with social dominance. Um, so environmentalism finds natural allies in the social justice movement. And, and we hope to continue encouraging the social justice movement to find allies in the environmental movement. We're going to have to take a brief musical break right now. When we come back, we will continue talking to Max Wilbert and Will Falk about Deep Green Resistance and what you can do. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're in the right place. Welcome back. This is Your Own Health and Fitness. I'm Jeffrey Fawcett. I'm talking today with Will Falk and Max Wilbert from the Deep Green Resistance Organization about environmental activism and not only creating a different world, but saving the one we've got. Our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, has more information about this show and our archive of almost 700 shows, a free stream of today's show, and access to our archive of show recording, which is now free and open access. To contact us, email us at admin at your own health and fitness .org. Max, how can listeners learn more about Deep Green Resistance? Well, the, the easiest thing to point people towards is our website, which is deepgreenresistance.org. But I definitely recommend that people go beyond that. I feel like that's sort of the easy way out the, these days to get people involved in clicktivism and doing things online. You know, when the reality is that face to face is so much better and more important. So we have contact information on our website. 
get in touch, let us know where you are and ask if there's anybody in your area or your region who would be willing to get together with you and sit down and talk about these things in person or come to any community groups you're involved in or any spaces you're involved in. Because I really think that, or, you know, organizing is all about building real relationships and that sort of thing doesn't happen online. It happens face to face. So I definitely recommend people do that. Great. I'd like to hear from the two of you about the things that Deep Green Resistance is doing. In particular, how that differs from what mainstream environmental organizations are doing. And most importantly, how those projects serve your strategic goals. I can go ahead and get started. Yeah. And Will, do you want to chip in? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. Okay, great. So I can just run through real quick. I, I put together a list. So for people who are members of Deep Green Resistance, we have sort of a formal process for membership and people getting, uh, getting officially involved. And part of that is submitting uh, a couple little reports a few times a year just about what have you been up to, um, what kind of work are you doing. So from that and from talking to people, it's possible to assemble a pretty good list of what everyone's up to. And uh, we have some people who are fighting coal mines in Australia. Uh, we have people who are working on pipeline resistance work in New York, uh, New England, the broader New England area, and Florida. Uh, we have some people working on old growth forest protection in British Columbia, as well as in Australia, fighting fracking in Colorado and in the UK. Uh, we have people working on behalf of both the buffalo here in the US and the European buffalo. Um, we have people doing prairie dog defense work uh, along the, the front range in Colorado, especially. We have a lot of people doing media and support work. Uh, our website, I recently realized, is now partially or fully translated into 21 languages. And that's been done all by volunteers, grassroots volunteers, people who have just contacted us and said, we appreciate your strategy and we appreciate what you're doing. So we want to help help spread this information by translating. Um, we have people doing restoration projects and, and uh, native gardening projects in various areas. Uh, indigenous solidarity work in a few different areas around the country and around the world. Um, and then Will can talk a little bit more about uh, maybe some of our our Pinion Juniper stuff and Rights for Nature work, Will? Yeah, yeah, we just, uh, there, a group of us, a group of DGR members um, recently helped to file a first in the nation lawsuit uh, seeking the rights of nature for a major for a major ecosystem and that major ecosystem was the Colorado River um, and we we did that um, that flowed from our uh, understanding of of some of the major problems within the United States at least and and that major problem uh, being in one of the very foundations of American culture, and that is the American legal system. Uh, the American legal system currently treats nature as property, and because nature is treated as property, it is consumed and destroyed. So we were trying to um, get our get our hands in the in the actual machinery of of American law and try to uh, twist that into. Um, into a court declaration that that would actually recognize uh, the rights of nature. Um, we've we've long been involved in um, protecting pinyon juniper forests in um, the Inner Mountain West. Uh, so from the Colorado Plateau all the way over into um, Eastern California, uh, this work has has sprung up a kind of. Um, kind of incidentally to uh, work to stop the Southern Nevada Water Authority's uh, water grab. They, the, the Southern Nevada Water Authority has plans to um, drain uh, several Great Basin valleys of their groundwater to fuel um, or to get water to Las Vegas. And 
as we were going through the Great Basin, we started to notice um, that there were these big tracts of forests that were that were clear cut. Um, they were actually uh, chained, which is a process of stretching a, a navy battleship's anchor chain between two tractors and driving it across uh, the land and pulling up everything in its in its path. Um, but we, we think that the rights of nature work can fold into, into the pinion juniper work too, because, um, the pinion juniper, uh, biotic communities, uh, are essential to life in great, in the great basin. And as long as they're, um, not even recognized as beings with their own worth, uh, they'll continue to be, to be clear cut, um, can I can, can I just inter, interject here? One of the one of the things that um, is is fascinating about that issue, uh, and there's an organization that we've interviewed on this show that you're working with called the um, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund that is very much focused on that uh, rights of nature issue. That seems to be to be one of the issues, the things that you are involved in that really directly goes to this issue of hastening the collapse of civilization. This is the most obvious piece of activity to give environments rights in social systems. So if you could talk some about how maybe talk a little bit more about how you, you would envision that from an organizational standpoint as uh, achieving this goal or moving towards this goal of hastening the collapse of civilization yeah i <laughs> i think the first thing that i want to say about about the rights of nature and this this is something that I've really learned a lot from Thomas Lindsay, the executive director of, of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund that that you just mentioned. Um, and, and what I want to say is the rights of nature are not what most people think they are. Um, and what I mean by that is while it would be great if the American legal system uh, could somehow change itself to recognizing uh, the natural world as, as being inherent, inherently valuable and, and granting the natural communities that give us rights the same rights as other citizens, the same rights as corporations even have. But I would like to suggest that the rights of nature movement is not so much about that as it is about showing people firsthand, walking them through the process of trying to create change through the American legal system, having them in, um, invest their hopes and dreams and their energy in, in making this change only to have the courts and the, and the government that's supposed to represent them break those dreams, dash those dreams, show them that they don't actually live in a democracy. And what happens when those people's dreams and hopes are are dashed like that is they are they're radicalized on the spot. They are um, they all of a sudden have this this anger that if if it can be directed in the right ways, um, we can actually use to make the changes that that we aren't b being able to make through the legal system. Um, so the way that that fits into uh, DGR's um, one of our goals to hasten the collapse of industrial civilization is, you know, you can't just uh, walk into a room of people and say, hey, we really need to hasten the collapse of industrial civilization. Um, <laughs> <laughs> most people don't uh, most people don't they're not there yet in their understanding they they also um you know they, they're not they're not ready for that and they still um hold on to this belief that that we can you know, vote the right people in the office and make the changes or we can through really smart arguments by lawyers um and and i'm a lawyer so i'm, I'm saying this self-deprecatingly um that if we can just make really smart arguments that the, the change is going to be made. Um, so the rights of nature and, and breaking people's um, breaking people's dependence and, and hope in these ineffective tactics, um, this, this is a really persuasive way to, to that goes beyond uh, rational argument. I think it's, this is a very persuasive way uh, to get into people's hearts and to c catalyze that anger that they're going to need um, to begin taking actions to hasten the collapse of industrial civilization. I think that one of the the 
main roles that DGR fills is we're one of the few organizations that are that are actually uh, creating the messaging that are actually out there saying, hey, industrial civilization is bad. It needs to come down. Um, and that that is fine as far as it goes. We can we can say that, and we can we can uh, try and um, we can try and convince people that we're right. Uh, but we we also need to really get into people's hearts, like I was saying. We need to show them. We need to give them that radical ed- education that only experience can give them. Um, so so DGR is involved in uh, some of these campaigns that. Uh, like like the rights of nature that take people through the process, let them see firsthand uh, how how the system does not work in their favor, and then DGR is there with other ideas that are beyond um, perhaps the legal system for um, for working against civilization. So, Max, did you want to add anything? Sure. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, we've we've talked about some of the work that DGR is doing, but one of the great things that's really laid out in the book uh, that's that's hard to cover in just a few minutes on the call because we we write about it extensively in the book and in great detail. We dive into a, an actual strategy for dismantling industrial civilization. And it's it's a two prong strategy. It's split into what we call above ground and what we call underground. And above ground is what our organization is. We're basically doing legal work. Um, and when I say legal, I mean stuff that isn't illegal. Um, so, you know, so we do do, we, we do take part in some nonviolent civil disobedience and some sort of relatively minor law breaking like that. But we actually call for underground organizations, which is really like a revolutionary, uh, a revolutionary organization. Um, to, to go underground and actually target some of the key systems that support industrial civilization. So things like the finance system, uh, global communications, uh, global energy systems, and, and, uh, and fuel systems. And, you know, when I've talked to people who are military veterans who have training in, uh, in these sort of things, they, they look at that strategy and they say, that's a good strategy. They say it's an effective strategy. And I don't, you know, I'm involved in DGR because I think there's something to this strategy, but I also want to say I don't think it's the end all and be all. I think it's one way of approaching things, and I think we have a lot of value to offer to people uh, in terms of strategic thinking and in terms of pushing people to be more radical and more militant in our thinking and recognizing that we are actually living in a war. We're living through a period of wartime, war against the planet. And that we need to we need to stop that war, and uh, so you know I I I think that the fact that we are as Will said we're one of uh, we're one of if not the only organization that's both calling for an end to industrial civilization and actually providing a strategy that has a chance to get us there. I have to break in here to ask for your help. You're listening to Your Own Health and Fitness. I'm Jeffrey Fawcett. And KPFA is in its winter fund drive. You can help with a donation by calling 800-439-5732 or by going online at kpfa.org and making a donation directly there. Doing it online uh, does save us a little time and trouble because we don't have to worry about pledges. We get the money directly. But however you can do it and in whatever amount you can afford, please donate today or pledge today by calling 800-439-5732 or going to the website kpfa.org. With a donation of $140 or more, we'll send you a copy of the book Deep Green Resistance by Eric McBay, Lier Keith, and Derek Jensen. These are the folks who inspired Will and, uh, or it is the book that inspired Will and Max to join Deep Green Resistance and work as passionately and and hard as they have to uh, save this planet and to save us all. I selected this book to uh, provide a, uh, a thank you gift 
because I want you to read it. If you can't afford $140 as a, as a donation, I still want you to read this book. Um, and uh, just donate what you can. But for $140, we, KPFA will send you a copy of Deep Green Resistance by Lear Keith, Eric McBay, and Derek Jensen. This book, although it does have some uh, frank and passionate discussion of the difficulties we have, is not principally about horror stories. The book begins with a discussion of literally what the problem is. So in a, in a section called The Problem, Lear Keith says, The black turn weighs barely two ounces on energy reserves less than a bag of M&Ms and wings that stretch to cover 12 inches. She flies thousands of miles searching for the wetlands that will harbor her young. Every year, the journey gets longer as the wetlands are desiccated by human demands. Every year, the turn, desperate and hungry, loses, while civilization, endless and sanguinous, wins. But it isn't just about the horror story. It begins with that horror story. But it ends with, again, Lear Keith, who is a very gifted writer, writing a section called Our Best Hope. And she concludes that section, that the, the book itself, by saying, In the time it takes to say yes, there's still time to make the possible real. There is still time for amphibians as a class, still time for justice to win against power and its rancid pleasures of domination. Will you join me? Pass that question not from mouth to ear, but from heart to heart. It will have to be whispered, but it can still blaze. Let it circle the globe until it comes all the way back. Will you join me? Yes is still possible, but yes, like love, needs to be a verb, our best and only hope. Let yes guide your aim, then let it loose. That's why I want you to read the book. There is passion in it, and yet there is deep an analysis of uh, the, the, the horrors we face and what we can do. For a copy of Deep Green Resistance, call 800-439-5732 or go online to kpfa.org and, and donate online. Donating online gets us the money directly and quickly. The discussion I had with Will and, uh, and Max and this book, Deep Green Resistance, is why you listen to KPFA. It's why we all listen to KPFA. It's not to hear the horror stories, which... Lord knows, uh, are plentiful enough. You can dial into just about any channel and hear the horror stories. The, the purpose of listening to KPFA is to help you lead an examined life. And it's people such as these who are passionate and radical and militant about ending the horror show are the people that we want to listen to because they hold out the promise, the promise of making what is possible real, to say yes, to join us. 800-439-5732 or kpfa.org. Please donate $140 for a copy of this book, Deep Green Resistance. Or if that's too stiff for you, uh, donate what you can at the 25, uh, for $25, you can become a vo voting member of KPFA and vote for the local station board and receive notifications of actions on KPFA. Uh, and in between, there's a whole array of uh, thank you gifts that are, are available. Uh, and if you do it online, uh, my under I haven't looked at this, but my understanding is that there's uh, you can... You can uh, cruise through and see what kind of thank you gift you would like to select. But the important thing is, is not the gift itself. We are happy to give it to you. It is, it is 
part of uh, a gift economy, which is not about exchange. It's not about equal for equal. It's not about what is at the root of our civilization, which is the accumulation of value. It is about supporting each other. It is about being passionate and radical and militant about what matters in your life. 800-439-5732, kpfa.org. Donate now, please. Like the show, the book Deep Green uh, Resistance, invites you to the examined life, invites you to enter into a critical dialogue with what is happening and what you can do. As Will notes in some, some notes that he had sent to me, that the condition of the planet and of our society is not really a secret. We don't really need that much more of the horror story as such, unless it is to take appropriate action against it. What we need is what can we do? And he says even further that the question may be, What does the earth need? What does the planet need? What does the living world need from us? One of the things that Eric McBeigh writes extensively about in Deep Green Resistance is the range of actions that can happen that will be necessary to happen to create a movement. That Uh, movement of deep green resistance. It's a resistance movement. And the examined life is your place both in the world but also in that movement. And uh, Eric McBay writes eloquently about what has happened in the past and the hope and support to take from previous resistance movements that can give you heart to engage in movement to help protect the planet to help protect uh, yourself your family your friends your uh, your community uh, that's what this book is about it is about the examined life and what you can do the purpose of the show in this station is to answer the question what can i do More importantly, it's to answer the question, what can we do? And that's what this book does. Deep Green Resistance by Eric McBay, Lear Keith, and Derek Jensen. And to ask yourself, what can you do? What can we do to do what you can? To do it intelligently. To do it from the perspective of an examined life. Of considering carefully what your life needs to be. So, as Will says, it's to promote a life-centered movement, a movement that will take on the horror show. For a pledge of $140 or more, we will send you a copy of Deep Green Resistance by uh, Eric McBay, Lear Keith, and Derek Jensen. And uh, you can do that by calling 800-439-5732 or going to kpfa.org. We need your support. We need you to join us. We need to support you because we are here for you. That's the only purpose for this station. We are here to support you. We are here to support you with the passion and the power of narratives such as Deep Green Resistance, which thinks of itself, argues that the movement necessary to prevent the horrors that we are seeing in the world, the extinction of species, uh, I, dr- I, I dread to think that it is possible that in my lifetime, the last elephant will die, or the last uh, amphibian or uh, the myriad creatures that are going to go extinct because of the depredations of industrial civilization. The resistance movement is 
part of a fight against the civilization that creates those horrors, uh, the dominant culture, and what it does. And as, as they point out, it is not just doing it to the natural world, it is doing it to us. It is fracturing us, sending us apart, alienating us from ourselves, from our work, from our world. And it is work, like the work of Deep Green Resistance, that is fighting against that that is resisting that. That's why it is a resistance movement. And the virtue of this book is that it will describe to you the different intensities with which you can participate in that movement. Uh, participate in a way that you are capable, in a way that motivates you, that moves you, that gets you to f fight the f good fight that needs to be done. It will not be easy. It will not be simple. Your support of KPFA keeps that resistance visible, and it needs to be visible. It needs to be talked about. We need to keep talking about it because that is what is going to make the world worth living in, worth continuing in, worth uh, getting to my 100th birthday. Uh, actually, please help me get to my 100th birthday. Uh, that's almost 30 years away now, uh, so that the elephants are still around when uh, I go belly up. I'm asking you to keep this world here in one piece to help repair it, to join this movement, join KPFA, 800-439-5732, kpfa.org to donate directly, 800-439-5732, kpfa.org. I've been promoting this book for $140. That's Deep Green Resistance by Eric McBeigh, Lear Keith, and Derek Jensen as a thank you gift. But KPFA and this radio show, Your Own Health and Fitness, is not in the business. We're not here to sell books or DVDs or clothing or any other kind of merchants, merchandise. I'm not scolding you. Uh, I'm not telling you anything's wrong with that. I think it's more like a bake sale or a car wash or a collection plate. As I said earlier, it's not about exchange. This is not the exchange economy. This is a gift economy. Your gift to us is the financial support that keeps us on the air, that keeps us presenting to you views and people who cannot get on any other media, that they can come to you and speak from their hearts, speak with their passions, speak radically, militantly about ending the horror show. Uh, this gift economy brings that to you, and your gift to us keeps us on the air and able to bring that to you. So I'm asking you to please pledge now at 800-439-5732 or go online and donate directly at kpfa.org. It's an acknowledgement and, and a recognition that you're with us and we're with you. I want to close with what I read earlier from Lear Keith because it, it, it is both profound and moving. In the time it takes to say yes, there's still time to make the possible real. There's still time for amphibians as a class, still time for justice to win against power and its rancid pleasures of domination. Will you join me? Pass that question, not from mouth to ear, but from heart to heart. Let it circle the globe until it comes all the way back. Will you join me? Yes is still possible, but yes, like love, needs to be a verb, our best and only hope. Let yes guide your aim, then let it loose. Please let it loose. Call now, 800-439-5732, kpfa.org. Will you join me? Thank you for listening. Visit our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, for easier extended access to our almost 700 archive shows. With our free library feature, you can listen to all of them, any of them and all of them. There's also a free stream of this week's show and lots more at yourownhealthandfitness.org. If you want to contact us, please 
Email us at admin at yourownhealthandfitness.org. Your Own Health and Fitness is produced by Lena Berman and Dr. Jeffrey Fawcett. Remember, being informed not only protects your health, it protects your freedom. to 94.1 KPFA 